Hi everybody, my name is Casey Waugh. I'm an occupational therapist from Pittsburgh. I made this video last week and in the editing process, I scrapped it. So we are redoing it. I talked too much. There was too much information that wasn't important. So we're just gonna get right down to it. I apologize for the setup here. Um, our kids have been home from daycare, so our routine has been crazy, but that's besides the point. I'm happy to do this. I'm happy to get it up a week late. That's okay. Let's just jump into it. When it comes to sensory play, Pinterest and also occupational therapists have kind of made it into this like super expensive, really heavy prep, very messy thing. And it doesn't have to be. This video is not going to tell you about all the different ways that you can do messy play at home. You don't need me for that. This video is going to talk about how to incorporate different senses into play. And that's it. Why is sensory rich play important? Incorporating different senses into play provides your child with learning opportunities. We know that activating different senses provides different neurochemicals to be released in the brain. We are not talking about which play opportunities will do each thing because that gets more into treatment and these videos are not for OT treatment. They are for parents and what you're already doing. So we're just going to talk about how to remember all of the senses and get them into play today. Playing with your kids on the floor in their space is the best thing that you can do as a parent. It does not matter if you have spent two hours making a rainbow rice bin. You could be playing with a diaper box. Being there, playing, engaging, interacting in a back and forth, whether they can talk to you or not, communicating with facial expressions, some kind of back and forth, loving touch, all of that is profoundly more important than having any kind of expensive or special sensory toy. Engaging, touching, loving on your kids. That creates connection and that creates change in the brain. Children learn their sense of safety and build connections to process sensory information by interacting with the world in the presence of a loving, available adult. That adult being consistent and present to co-regulate, to be happy with them, be sad with them, to help them recognize that different emotions are okay and that you're always going to be there. That is going to make the biggest impact on your kids, even when they have sensory issues, because connection and co-regulation you can practice all of that in play and adding in extra senses will just make it a more rich, I couldn't think of another word, rich, a more experiential, a more beneficial play environment. And it doesn't have to be anything crazy, nothing expensive. You can use what you already have to do this. So let's review what the different senses are. Touch, taste, smell, sight, and hearing. And then the three other ones that aren't as commonly talked about, vestibular, which is your sense of where your head is in space. It tells you if you are moving, if you are moving up and down, side to side, in a circle. And it also tells you how fast you are moving. Um, proprioception, that is your sense of self when it comes to your body. It tells you where your arm is, where your foot is, without you having to look at it. And interoception, that is your internal awareness. It tells you when you need to go to the bathroom, when you're hungry, when you're tired. So today we are going to touch on all of those senses except interoception because we're not going to be playing with that. First, let's touch on touch. A simple Google search or a Pinterest search will lead you to believe that there are a million and one different ways to play with different textures in a messy way. 
sensory bins, beans, rice, all of that stuff, which are wonderful. And there is a time and a place for all of those things. Kids love them. But that's not the only way that you can play with touch. I talked about this a little bit just a second ago, but touch from you, loving touch, that creates brain growth, especially in our really, really young infants, babies. Research shows that in very severe situations, when babies are not touched, when they are in their infancy, think about children who are in like orphanages who do not have any kind of contact with a loving adult, their brains are 20 to 30% smaller than they should be. Loving touch is a way to incorporate touch into play. A gentle hand on the back, some squeezes on their arms, rubbing the cars up and down their arms while you're playing with cars, something like that, incorporating touch that way. Another way is to just explore the different textures of the toys you already have. You can find something that is smooth, something bumpy, something soft, something squishy. If you have a baby, put them out and just talk about what they are when they grab something. Ooh, that ring is smooth. It's cold. This stuffed animal is squishy. It's so soft. Talking about what different things feel like, you're playing with touch. Older kids, preschool, even up through elementary, you can do some sort of scavenger hunt. Tell them to go find something. Go find something smooth, hard, and um, cold. Toddler age, just put them out and see if they can identify which ball is bumpy, which ball is spiky. Talking about and interacting with different toys that you already have and just feeling them, exploring them, touch taste and smell. Now this might not be something that you do every day, but incorporating new and exciting tastes in a fun and non-pressured way can be super cool. The best way to do this is to incorporate your kids into cooking, um, something that you may be doing already, or if you have a special event that you're making cupcakes, something, anything like that. Bring your kids in. You're gonna get smell. You're gonna also probably get some touch when you're mixing and making a giant mess, yes. Um, but smell and taste. You could even, if you have a more adventurous kiddo, um, you could explore taste. Try some lemon juice, vinegar, something salty, something bitter. That is a novel way to include a very strong sense in a fun way. Your sense of smell goes directly to your brain and it is very close to the area of emotional memory. So you'll know what I'm talking about if you've ever walked past someone on the street and you get a whiff of like your ex's cologne or perfume and you're like, that memory is triggered out of nowhere because of your sense of smell. So when you use something like a, an essential oil diffuser or a candle or some kind of naturally scented room spray, you can start to make associations. You, you know, you'll remember certain smells with certain things. That's why people say to use lavender scented lotion before bed. If you do that every night, then sometimes that scent can trigger, oh, it's bedtime routine and start to calm you down. Scent can set the environment. That's something that you would do as a parent if you wanted to light a candle before playtime or use the essential oils, whatever. I recommend using natural scents as opposed to like a, a chemical room spray because those aren't aren't great. They can give you headaches. As, and if you have a sensitive child, you don't want to overpower with, with strong chemical scents. But scent and taste are senses that you may not think about but they can be really fun to play with. Hearing and sight. In my opinion, these are two senses that we actually need to kind of decrease our exposure to. Can your child handle silence? Can they play quietly? Is the TV always on in the background? We are constantly inundated with, with fast paced visuals. We hear a lot of different things. Toys are flashing lights, and those are the toys that our kids are drawn to. Um, but we are constantly being bombarded with visual and hearing input. So we gotta bring that down. My recommendation for sight is to decrease the amount of distraction and the amount of flashing lights, toys that are battery operated, when you're going to have a good playtime with your child. Battery operated toys generally 
you as the player don't have to do as much. They do a lot for you. They play for you. You push a button, something happens. Those toys are not inherently bad. However, if you want some good quality play, I recommend using toys that do not have batteries or take the batteries out so you don't have the constant flashing lights or the sound. If you're able to do a toy rotation and only have five to six toys out at a time for a week or two weeks, wonderful. If not, and it's time to play, cover those other toys with a blanket, put them out of sight, out of mind. Our kids are not great with impulse control. So if they their eye catches something else, they're gonna wanna go play with that. So to get really great, engaged, purposeful, meaningful play, creative play, less options is actually better. Save those battery operated toys for times when you as the parent need to get something done or you have a phone call to make because those, those toys are super engaging and they're not the devil. You can still play with them, but when you want that good one-on-one -on -one sensory rich play time that we should be aiming for every day, parent and child, um, save it for toys that don't have batteries. With sound, you can totally use music to set the tone. I talked about in my sleep video how sound can actually entrain your brain to get to certain wavelengths. If your child is sleepy or blobby and you wanna wake them up for some playtime, you can put on music that is more arrhythmic, like Latin dance music, samba, salsa music, jazz, something like that that makes you wanna move. You put it on and you kind of naturally are like, oh, it does something to you. If your child is generally like more high, fast paced, and you wanna kind of bring them down for some focused play, using things that have strong beats and bass, like rap or hip hop, reggae, even if you wanna go all the way to like Gregorian chants, something with a strong bass beat is going to be great for just regulating and setting the tone. Sound is great for that. That's also a great tip for meal times. If you've got somebody who's like falling asleep and you still have to eat dinner, put on some of that peppy music, or if your child is not wanting to sit, put on some of that deep bass music. Side note, vestibular and proprioceptive input I'm gonna talk about together. So you don't need a lot of space and you don't need a special $200 swing to get movement into play. The easiest way is to incorporate distance and height into something that you're already playing with. Basically encourage moving in different ways. So for example, if you're playing with a puzzle, let's say that, let's say it's an alphabet puzzle that has 26 pieces. You take those 26 pieces and you spread them around your space. You could spread them around your playroom, your living room, um, throughout the kitchen, the whole house, whatever you wanna do. That is an easy way to add distance to a simple activity like a puzzle. Another way could be to incorporate height. If you're doing that same puzzle, put the puzzle board on the couch and all the pieces on the floor. If you have an older child, then maybe they have to hang upside down off of the couch to get their puzzle pieces, then bring them back up. The goal is to get the head in different positions and to just add some movement. Now I will say if you have a child who is like, you're like Casey, she moves all the time. Like, I hear you, so we want to keep this movement goal-directed. That's kind of what makes it different than just a, a free-for-all in the playground or something like that. We are giving our kids a goal in moving for a purpose. So if they are always climbing on the couch, take those couch cushions off of the couch and let's try an obstacle course, crawling, um, climbing under the chairs of the dining room table going over those squishy couch cushions and having a goal. Again, whether it's go get your favorite toy, it's at the end of the obstacle course, then crawl back on your belly to come back to the start. Yeah, it might mean that you have to mess up your, your living room or your dining room for a little bit, but hey, at the end, another way let's get some movement in is to put everything back. Movement can be achieved in small spaces, apartments, whatever you're working with, by keeping those three things in mind distance, height, and head movements. Hanging off of the back of the couch, great, if there's a purpose to it. Somersaults, um, passing something between your legs and you have to you know, put your head upside down to do that. You don't need a lot of space to do that and that's gonna give you a ton of vestibular input. 
If your kid's a jumper, put something on the wall like uh, letters of their name or something that they really enjoy, like different pictures of dinosaurs or transportation items, cars, trucks, trains, whatever. Put a picture on the wall and then call something out and they have to run and jump to hit that picture on the wall. It takes a little bit of creativity, but using what your kids already like, distance, height, head movement, you can add movement to that play. And vestibular and proprioceptive input are heavy hitters. They release a lot of neurochemicals in the brain. If you have any questions about like being specific about ways to get movement into your play, email me. I've said it before, I don't like to give a ton of very specific suggestions because every kid is different. And movement for one kid can be very alerting and that same movement can be super organizing for another. So me saying, spin 20 times this direction then jump and hit that picture, that might work for you, but for the kid next to you, not gonna work. So if you have or want um, specific questions answered, Email me, I'm here. Sensory experiences throughout the day are so important, but like I said way at the beginning, engagement in purposeful play with you as the parent is, is more important. Sometimes when we have kids who have a lot of sensory needs, getting that good one-on-one -on -one play time with you, or you know maybe not one-on-one, -on -one, if you've got other kids too, getting play time that is purposeful and engaging can be hard. So adding senses, increasing the amount of variety in play, keeping it novel in that way, or um, entering into the play that they are already in if they don't like change, entering in with what they like and love and adding one difference to increase the challenge or to add some other sense can help to expand their sense of the world, experience with the world, build connections in their brains, and help them feel safe in the presence of their loving adult, you. Sensory rich play throughout the day also will help your kids sleep. So those neurochemicals that are being released through this type of play, especially movement play, it helps your body get ready for sleep. It fills up their cup that needs to be emptied when they sleep. I don't know if that analogy really works right there, but sensory rich play throughout the day is what can kickstart melatonin development and creation when it's time for sleep. Even if you are inside and you can't go anywhere, think about the different senses you have and how you can incorporate them with what you already have. Small space or not, big toys or not, sensory toys or not. Honestly, if you have the space or the time to do it, outdoor play is your, that is your best, you're gonna get the most bang for your buck if you play outside every day. Where I am, um, sometimes that's possible and sometimes it's not. I know people say there's no bad weather, there's just bad clothing, but sometimes it's just not practical when you have an infant. Um, you can't necessarily go outside in the rain all, you know, to play in the rain when it's super cold and, and icy like it is in Pittsburgh. But outdoor play, wonderful, best option for sensory rich play. You don't even have to do much. Just going outside is gonna give you a ton of sensory input. But even if you're inside, my encouragement to you is to print out the picture that I have for free in the description box. It's just a reminder for you. You have all of these senses at your disposal. So what senses are you gonna play with today? I hope that this was helpful. And again, if you have specific questions about your kids, let me know. I would love to help um, because every kid is different. Every sensory kid is different. So specific strategies work for some, but not for others. So I am happy to help in any way that I can. If you have ideas for certain videos that you'd like me to cover, let me know. Um, please follow me on Instagram, find me on Facebook, subscribe here, hit the bell to get notified, all of that fun stuff. If you like it, give it a thumbs up. Um, thanks. I will see you guys next week.